Human Genome Project was a big international consortium to sequence a reference copy of the human genome. Every cell in our body has 46 chromosomes. Um, they come in pairs, one that you got from your mother and one which you got from your uh, father. And these are long molecules of DNA. And DNA is just a chemical. So what we mean by sequencing the human genome is we determine what that chemical looks like for a kind of idealized person, a kind of, a, a kind of conceptualized reference person, which we can all use for research and for medicine. In the 1970s, a number of people, in particular Fred Sanger, worked out how to sequence DNA, so to determine the chemical composition of this polymer. The polymer has a lot of structure, so although we could write it down as a long chemical, we don't. We use the letters A, T, G, and C. So we talk about bases or letters. And Fred and colleagues worked out how to do this for about 500 letters in a row. Now, the human genome is three billion letters. Now, that's much bigger than 500. But in the early 80s, people realized that it was going to be feasible to think about determining the DNA sequence of the human genome, three billion letters. It wasn't going to be easy. They were going to need lots of new technology, but it was going to be feasible. So that's when the project started. People realized that it would transform lots of things. It would certainly transform research. All the way through the 80s and the 90s, people were looking at different individual parts of the human genome and they were making amazing discoveries, but they realized that it was going to be much easier if we had the whole thing in front of us. And then people sort of speculated on what else it could enable in the future, how we could look at variation between people or how we could look at particular disease. So there was a lot of justified excitement and enthusiasm about getting the uh, sequence of the human genome. From its conception, it was always conceived as an international project with many groups, academic groups and technology groups around the world contributing. Now, a lot of those groups were in America and there was a lot of emphasis uh, in the US about doing this. A particularly strong group was here in the UK on the same campus where Emily EBI is now, um, led by John Solston, who was a molecular biologist. He was obsessed with two things, worms, and genomes. There were also important contributions from France, from Germany, and from Japan, and right at the end, uh, some contributions from China. Scientists use the word gene in different ways, and it's got an interesting history. So we were using the word gene um, back in the 1900s, uh, in the discovery of genetics, and this is before people knew that it was DNA which was the information carrying molecule between generations. And let's take this classic set of experiments by Mendel. He has these peas. Some of them are wrinkly, some of them are smooth. Some of them have different colors. Now the wrinkly or smooth or the different colors we can call phenotypes. And the idea is there's one gene for a particular type of phenotype. What, what smooth or rough for the peas, the color. And then if you're in Drosophila, what color eyes or what wing shape or how many um, bristles on your legs. Later on, people worked out that particular bits of DNA were making particular bits of RNA and making particular proteins. And very often that previous definition of a gene, which is association to a particular physical trait, would map to one of these proteins. And so the word gene also became associated with this collection of DNA, RNA, protein, one DNA, one RNA, one protein. So in the 1990s, we didn't know how many genes there were in the human genome. We didn't have the human genome. But scientists were making uh, educated or less educated guesses about the number. So one was to take a, the same view as Mendel did with his piece, but with humans, all the different traits that are on humans, and try to kind of work out a rough estimate from the differences between different humans and their genetics. And that gave a number of between 20,000 to 30,000. Other people looked at how big a piece of DNA in the genome was needed to make a protein coding gene. And there's a, it's more complicated than it looks, so that's a slightly complicated set of, a, um, sort of estimates. But you end up with uh, around 50,000 to 150,000 genes. 
Now, in the 1990s, uh, DNA sequencing got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so some companies got set up to sequence genes kind of on the cheap. So they were sequencing the genes, but not the genome. And they would sell access to these libraries of genes. And when you purchased through them, you'd get access to what they claimed were 100,000 or 150,000 genes. But another one was set up by Craig Venter called Solera. And they said that they would sequence the genome 10 years earlier than the public project. Now this was gobsmacking. It was gonna take 25 years to sequence the human genome. The academic project had a plan. And suddenly this um, commercial uh, outfit was standing up saying, we're gonna do it 10 years earlier. And the reason why we'll make money is because we'll sell access to that. Academics will get it under some free-ish academic license, uh, but companies will have to pay. I was working at the Sanger Center at the time. I remember John Salston calling us all together uh, in the room uh, here on campus and saying, um, this is actually really exciting and really positive because a company has just shown how important what we, what we are doing is. And to kind of, he, he sort of rallied the troops there internally saying this is a good thing. Now, what he was also doing at the time was talking to his major funder, which was the Wellcome Trust, and saying to the Wellcome Trust that he didn't think it was a good idea for a single company to control uh, access to the human genome information for that long. And he thought it was much better if the human genome was made as a gift for all of mankind. And the Wellcome Trust agreed with him. And so John was in a position when he talked to his American colleagues to say, if necessary, the Sanger Center here and the Wellcome Trust would sequence the entire human genome and make it freely available to everyone, companies and academics, everyone in every country. And that gave enough influence or power to the academics on the American side to also come and match the same commitment that the Wellcome Trust had made. And so suddenly the public project accelerated by 10 years. Suddenly our end date wasn't 2010, but 2000. It was a very interesting time being a bioinformatician. I was a graduate student working with Richard Durbin. I actually developed some software that analyzed the human genome to work out where the genes were. My software was notoriously slow, but notoriously accurate. And so when my software said this is where a particular gene is, you could be reasonably certain it was there. And interestingly enough, both the Solera project, the private project, and the academic project, the public project, used my software as a, as a baseline of where some protein coding genes were. The company Solera, which was full of really interesting and exciting scientists, said, um, actually this is great that the academic project was accelerating and giving out all this data openly. That made their project go even faster and they would still be a very successful company because of the way they were going to analyze the human genome, um, not just determine the genome. And in fact, they switched their production mainly to mouse, knowing that the public project was going to be doing a lot of human. And because of that, there was a feeling that this was likely to be true, that there, were, that, that there was going to be a lot of bottlenecks in the analysis and a lot of sophistication needed. And so the public project, again, in the UK here, funded by the Wellcome Trust, started to really deepen the amount of analysis it had. And that's where, when I stopped being a student, I actually joined Emily BI to lead the ensemble project in this area. Our goal was to analyze the human genome. The first and most important thing was where are the protein coding genes on the human genome? And of course, from that, we would be able to simply count them. So we could answer the question, how many protein coding genes there were? I'll move on to 2000. Every year, the genome community meets in Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island, just outside of New York City. And we sort of show off to each other and discuss what we've done and what we're planning to do. And at this time, that meeting was, was just humming. It was buzzing uh, with people excited about the future of the human genome and this public project and the private project. It was all very exciting. And um, I uh, presented our, 
our initial work on analyzing human genes with my colleagues Michelle Clamp and Tim Hubbard. And I also, at that point, said I will uh, run a betting book uh, about the number of genes in the human genome, because it was a very open question. People did not know how many there were. The rules of the bet was, you know, closest number wins, a sweepstake, and on 2000, one dollar would buy you a number. The next year, you would need five dollars to buy you a number, and the year after, twenty dollars to buy you a number. And in three years' time, we would determine the number of genes in the human genome. Pretty much everyone at that meeting betted, including many, many Nobel Prize winners. Um, and many, many scientists bet over the, the next uh, three years. At the time, a very brave Frenchman, uh, Hugues Rost Crelius, stood up uh, and he worked with Jean Weissenbach. And he said that there was going to be around 26,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. And I remember everybody, sort of the sharp intake of breath we all had. Because don't forget, there was a company um, insight that was selling access to 100,000 genes. Um, the C. elegans, the worm, was being sequenced and it looked like it was going to have about 20,000 protein coding genes, that sort of number. And so everybody was thinking, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's got to be more. <laughs> it's got to be more than a worm. And uh, it's, it's going to be, you know, somewhere up um, in, in a pretty high number. Two people went below Ook. And when in 2003, the terms of the bet were up, we actually still did not know the precise number of protein coding genes in the human genome. But we knew it was way below the lowest number betted. The lowest number was around 25,000. And it was very clear it was going to be around 20,000, maybe a little bit below 20,000. This was a big surprise. These are, I must stress, protein coding genes, but that was the term of the bet. And there was a moment where I think people were a bit humbled in two ways. Firstly, many, many clever scientists were wrong in that betting game. And that was a situation where you can really show that our knowledge moved forwards a lot. And that, I think, shows you the power of data and the importance, obviously, the difference between speculation and actually assessment and, and understanding something. And the second thing was this moment of realization, which is that complexity is not really about the number of protein coding genes you have, but how you use them, how you switch them on and switch them off, how they um, make one of us, or indeed a fish or an oak tree or, or, or anything else. And so a realization that it's about the combinations of how genes are used rather than just the number, which is the important thing. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. The first great technological triumph of the 21st century. And every so often in the history of human endeavor, there comes a breakthrough that takes humankind across a frontier and into a new era. Like all things in genomics, it's about definitions. So in 2003, we declared the human genome essentially complete. Now, essentially is doing a lot of work there. And what we meant at the time was that there were these parts of the human genome that were full of the same sequence of letters just repeated again and again and again and again and again. And actually, we had no technology to work out what the configuration of those repeats were in, in the kind of worst-case scenarios. And there were some worst-case scenarios. There were some scenarios which, in theory, you could solve, but in practice, it was just really, it was just not going to be very easy. So in 2003, we said we'd done everything that our technology could access, and the rest of it, we're just going to have to like put a kind of official question mark there. Now, just recently, a combination of new technologies have come together to allow us to go from one end of a chromosome all the way to the other end. I mean, not just once, but, um, but we can get the, the DNA sequence all the way through. 
The ends of chromosomes are called telomeres, so inside of the lingo this is called a telomere to telomere assembly or a T to T assembly. And in particular Karen Migi in uh, Santa Cruz on the west coast of the United States and um, Adam Philippi in NHGRI in Bethesda uh, in Washington DC have worked out how to do this with a big collaboration of, of people and we're going to see more and more of these T to T assemblies coming through in the future. So the human genome, as expected, has had a big impact on research in all sorts of different ways. So much so, I think it's quite hard to imagine research before the human genome was around. Now, I, I did do research before the human genome was around, and it was kind of, it was a very different world. You, you didn't know all the genes. You, didn't, you couldn't design what you were going to look at and where. And now all of that has become, you can make comprehensive reagents. You can look at all the genes simultaneously about their expression. You can do all sorts of different things where the genome ends up being the thing you design your experiments with and the things that you place your experiments on to understand what's going on. It allows you to understand the evolution of the human genome relative to the mouse, the chicken, the fruit fly, everything. And it allows you to uh, place experiments on the human genome so that when different experiments from different labs or your own lab over different times, you can organize where they are and, and sort of what they mean using the human genome. So that's a whole thing about understanding molecular biology and evolution. And it also enabled our ability to look at variation between humans really, really easily. So each human, of course, we come with two copies of the genome, one from our mum, one from our dad. Those genomes are not identical to the reference, they're, they're unique. Um, and we can then look at those unique differences and track what they do relative to how cells work relative to how tissues work and relative to how we work as, as organisms and as individuals. Emble EBI provides the master copy of much of this data. So most obviously the reference human genome, but not just the reference human genome, but also the protein coding genes and the genes and the other features on the genome and what those protein coding genes make in terms of proteins and how they form into three-dimensional structures, or not, sometimes they don't, to do things, and then how those three-dimensional structures work together to execute a particular part of our molecular biology, make a particular cell work in a particular way. And not only do we do this for humans, but we do it for macaques, and marmosets, and mice, and rats, and platypus, and chickens, and it goes all the way through to plankton, and bacteria, and everything else and even to these very nasty viruses like the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. And in each of those cases, not only do we have the genome, but what the genome makes as RNA, what the RNA makes as protein, and how the proteins fold. So it is an amazing, it's like a starry sky of data, and scientists are working out another little piece of that sky and putting it up, and we keep this whole sky there available for science to use, both now and in the future. The thing I'm really excited about is combining AI with genomics data and other molecular data. AI is just such a good fit to biology. We have these very high dimensional complex data sets which we kind of want to wrestle to the ground and understand and these uh, deep neural networks are giving us a completely new way to uh, access it. I've watched my colleagues get involved. I'm doing a little bit with the researchers in my own group. I'm just excited to see what happens next. Yeah.